Okay, well, I have um, right, at, right after seven o'clock. So for the sake of um, staying on schedule, we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Laura Warden. I'm the current president of the Southeast Endurance Riders Association, which is sponsoring this webinar tonight on long distance trailering with your horses, with the idea that we have the national championship coming up in Montana, not too far off. And we've asked um, Heather and Jeremy Reynolds to come on and help us um, answer some questions regarding long distance trailering with our horses. And I can't think of two better people to do this. So. Um, there are just a few um, housekeeping things that I do want to go through. Um, for all of those of you that are logged on, you probably know that or have found, recognized or realized that everybody has been muted upon entry. And that's pretty much just to cut down on feedback on our end. Um, several of you have already found the Q&A chat feature. Uh, that we will be monitoring it. I, I, since I am the moderator of this webinar tonight, I, I won't be looking at it necessarily through the whole presentation, but we will look at it for sure at the end. And any questions that you might, burning questions that you might have, I would encourage you to write them down there and we'll have Heather and Jeremy try to address it there. And then at the very end, if, if it doesn't get too convoluted or messy, um, you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask Heather and Jeremy your question directly if you don't wanna use the chat feature. But that's pretty much the housekeeping. So as you've already figured out, our panelists tonight are Jeremy and Heather Reynolds. And I wanna give you a little background information on them. Um, sorry, for just a second, I just lost what my train of thought here. Um, Heather and Jeremy Reynolds have, have a combined AERC rider mileage of 39,785 miles. I won't even accomplish that in my lifetime. So they have competed coast to coast, as well as top to bottom and everywhere in between in the USA and gone on plane rides, plane trips with, all, all over, 50, with over 15 different courses, followed by road trips in several foreign countries. And they have competed at all levels in endurance, as well as train and coach horses and riders to help them reach their goals. So how it's gonna work tonight is um, we asked everybody to submit questions in advance. And so we tried to combine them if there was a lot of repeat questions. So we, we tried to condense and combine them and I will read the individual questions and then I will give Jeremy and Heather the opportunity to answer it. And I've tried to break it up into some trailer maintenance questions and I want to add the caveat when it comes particularly to the main trailer maintenance questions. Um, Jeremy and Heather are not necessarily trailer maintenance experts. They're going to give you their opinion and um, when in doubt always consult with a professional when it comes to that. And then we'll get into some more specific questions regarding the long haul across country and how they approach certain situations based on the questions that you guys submitted in advance. So with that, let's just jump right into it. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, so again, first subset of questions has to do with trailer maintenance. And here's the first question to you guys. How do you recognize weak floorboards and welds from inside and under the trailer? Or maybe a better way to approach it is how often do you guys look at your floorboards and what are some things that you look for that might mean that they, you need some maintenance work done? Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so um, I, we check our floors and, and actually clean them. Well, on the wooden floors, you don't really have to clean them, but you have to check them. Actually, I, I check mine once a year. And then the aluminum um, floors, I cl completely clean out and scrub them clean and check. And so the wood, like if you just... I just take a nail and I poke them. And if you can push a nail in it, it, it is really spongy, then they need to be addressed. And then for aluminum, um, if you don't get the urine out of them at least once a year, you can get some etching and, um, and, it'll look, and you can actually start seeing pinholes if it's getting really weak. And um, 
and that's you'll see white areas where the urine has collected so um and yeah so i just check them once a year and if i have any questions i just take them to a professional i i only replace the wood by myself but 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 then again um but if it's the aluminum i just go and definitely have a professional look at it but yeah there you go and we don't have salted roads anywhere that we live so that's a whole other issue that we aren't familiar with but i'm sure causes all sorts of additional problems yeah Sure. Yeah, I imagine that's more of an issue up north or maybe even out west. <clears throat> All right. Moving on to the next question. For some reason, it's a little slow. Here's the next question. Again, with uh, trailer maintenance, how do you recognize typical tire wear and tear and how old tires actually are? One person kind of asked, you know, do you trust what the dealer tells you in terms of what tires are most appropriate for your trailer? Or how do you trust what they're telling you? Do you have any advice in that department? Yeah, so um, I'm the professional, the tra whoever you buy your trailers, they're they're only there to sell your trailer. Um, the there's, yeah, the tires. There's a uh, age on the tire. And I usually, I mean, it, it, you're supposed to replace them every five years, uh, whatever the age says. And, and the age is written on the tire yeah, itself. You can so, read it for yourself on your tire. And that's important to check too when you buy new tires, because sometimes you can buy a tire that's a year from being aged out. And um, we always go um, thicker ply than what's recommended, mainly because I don't want to replace tires. So for years, um, we had a friend that supplied all our tires and we got a, a really good deal and we would lose tires all the time. So then we started talking to long haul trailer people and they recommended going with like a 14, 15 ply tire. It's a lot more money, but I've only lost one in the last 10 years since I started going with those tires. So it's way worth it. Um, yeah, and I always replace them all and I just go with like a 15 ply tire and you're going to spend a lot more, but you're not going to be on the side of the road. Way less chances. What's the rating on them too? And they're, I think they're, I believe they're like a G rated tire. And then um, I also, they, when you get them mounted and balanced, well, they'll tell you it's a trailer. You don't need them balanced. Well, your horses are going to feel it if they're unbalanced. So I always spend the extra money and get them balanced. And then, um, and every trailer is different. So some trailers, if you over, like, cause those tires are rated to run at like 120 pounds of pressure. You usually only want to run them at like 90 ish. If, if, and that's even with a, a normal trailer cause they're rated to tow really big loads. So like I have a, my trailer, I want to say it's 16, around 16,000 pounds loaded. And so I you know loaded. And then, so I run um, like 90 PSI. And so the reason the, the, um, the pressure is important is because you can get uneven wear. So um, like if you're well, like, they're, like if you wear out the middle, you probably have over, over inflated. And if you're wearing out the shoulders or the sides, you're under inflated. And then you can get some waviness if you've got these really good tires, you can get some waviness on the inside shoulders that I've seen. And, and that's just from, you have to adjust and that's usually due to a little bit over inflation for the, that rated of tire. But, um, and then also aluminum rims are, are, the rims have their own weight rating. So we've had it where we've had rims go bad and this isn't this isn't so important when you're doing short um, trailer rides, but when you go on multi-day trips, your tires get a substantial amount warmer, and you can actually have rims go bad. Um, and we've only had that with aluminum rims, so we always switch to steel rims for that reason. And then there's all their maintenance things looking for. Um, to the rim and tire is um, you're looking for rust marks near the um, lug nuts. And that'll show if, you, if you've got a rust line near a lug nut. Now the rim itself can be rusted and the nut itself can be rusted. But if you see actually a drip line, like you would off of anything that's running water, you, you'll see a line coming off the, the nut itself. And that's a representation of a loose um, 
a nut or something's going wrong with the actual stud itself. So that's something, if you have any question, um, take it into your mechanic and, and have it looked at or whoever does your trailer maintenance. I hope that answers all those questions. Yeah, that was an excellent response. All right, we'll move on to the next question. So somebody wanted to know how, or actually more than one person wanted to know this, how do different trailer types affect hauling? For example, they wanted to know the difference between a basic stock trailer versus high, like a high-end slant load trailer versus a straight load. Is there any differences in terms of long distance hauling and how the horse travels yeah. and the impacts on? There's a, I've read a bunch of research papers on it. Um, I, I've been under the understanding that a straight load in the rear position is one of the best <laughs> to meaning, go. Meaning the horse riding backwards. Yeah, yeah. But we always, we haven't had a problem with um, slant loads, meaning we haven't seen like, do we have uh, more lameness on a, a, a certain rear leg or front leg due to um, long travel? Um, I don't, I mean, if you, in a perfect world, I think box stalls where they can be loose <laughs> is more ideal because I've heard of haulers that they can, the horses will actually lay down sometimes. If, especially if you bed the stalls really well, but um, I, I don't. I, ours are always been slants, and I haven't seen any ill effect of it. So I guess that, I hope that answers those questions. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, so that kind of summarizes the questions we got pertaining to this, basically the trailer trailer maintenance. The rest of the questions are just basically you know, having to do with how to prepare for a long haul and steps and procedures to follow along the route. So with that, um, one of the first questions are, that we got more than once was, what do you guys do to prior to the trip to get your horses ready? And uh, several people wanted to know, do you feed them differently? Do you do anything different in terms of just prepping the horse for the long haul? Yeah, so... Um... We, we go off, we treat every horse when we're traveling long, like they're all tie-up horses. So we, on their last workout, a day or so before a long haul. Maybe, um, maybe give an example, like the yeah. race is on Saturday and we're going to drive a long haul to achieve results on a Saturday race. So let's say we start our trip on Monday, just for this example. Yeah. So go ahead. So all, well, that'd be by days. So that would be. Do it however you want. Okay. So, um, well. It doesn't matter. So we don't grain. We work out, we give them their last workout and then don't grain the day or two before they leave. So, and we usually train them a day or so before they leave and then no grain until they're back into full work or they start the race. So if um, we're right, racing on a Saturday and we have a two day haul, for one, we want to get there at least one day, pr um, not the day before, but two days prior so, so which would be so we leave on a tuesday we drive tuesday wednesday they have thursday off and race um saturday. and they race saturday or well yeah yeah, yeah. so um that's on a two-day haul so and if it's a one-day haul we'll we want them to rest for one full day so if we uh, arrive thursday for a saturday ride yeah yeah so uh, and then on a, like a, if say we're going to Montana and it's a three day straight, that's three long days From to get Florida to, to Montana. Yeah. That's three long days of 12 or more hours. Then we give them at least that match time to get off. So they, we'd have three full days of rest before they would compete. Um, and then, but they would be exercising when they get there, meaning um, a lot of walking and maybe the day before the event um they would actually get a ride in um with the grain with the light right and they would not get grain until the morning of the event because they've been cooped up so um and that that's and and then so and then also pre-trip we would electrolyte we um our horses get salt every day um so they're already always kind of topped off so we'll we will electrolyte them right before we put them on the trailer and then um, and then depending on it, for every day they travel, they will get a, a 
dose of electrolytes, at least do. Yeah. If it's really hot, they might get two. And, um, I don't, I can't remember if this question has been asked but, or is in a later question, but um, water, water, uh, water yeah. Okay, water is later, but- um, Yeah, water, we, we've got a question for that. Yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll address that more later. But we told them about the change of pay. No, I'll throw the grass. Oh yeah, so we also um, switch our horses to grass when we travel and take them, if they're on alfalfa and take them off the alfalfa, because it's just, extra calories and stuff that they are not burning off and just, we're trying to limit tie-ups. We just treat everyone like a tie-up so that, um, so we, so that's something we can narrow out of our um, maybe possible problem that can occur. Yeah, in all of our travels, the most prevalent problem you'll face with long hauling horses is tying up. Yeah. Even if your horse has never tied up before, colic you would think might be high on the list. We've not had that issue, knock on wood, in our travels. Tie up, yes. Mm -hmm. So you have to manage the diet to prevent the tie up and manage the exercise accordingly. So just for clarification, you guys are feeding just free choice grass hay or just straight up grass. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else before we move on? No. Oh, uh, we also feed Outlast. Yeah. And we'll treat feed the Outlast at every uh, stopping point when we're offering the water mm -hmm. because that helps with their stomach on the travel. Yeah, and that's just something we've added in the last two years. And ever and since then, we actually don't have to use gastric or anything, but it's very rare. And it's usually only if we have a new horse come into the barn. So um, in trying to fix an old problem. So um, Outlast is a super, super good um, um, supplement cool. to help. And you can feed it just like a handful of it at each gas station that you stop at, and they'll eat it right out of your hand. And it's super simple. Yeah. So and we noticed big results as far as the whole group drinking and eating better when they're on that, it did make a big difference. Okay. That was what I was going to ask you if you saw a difference in their eating and drinking habits. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they eat a lot more hay. Yeah. Good. All right. You're ready. We can move on to the next question. Yep. Yeah. So the next question is shavings or no shavings or something like straw as bedding in the trailer. Um, we use shavings. Um, I like just a thin layer of shavings and I, I like the bigger um, flake. Um, so because it has less risk of um, flying around and getting in their eyes. And, and then um, we always put fly masks on our horses um, so that um, we limit stuff getting in their eyes, whether it be if we have windows open or just um, or just from maybe some shavings flying up into their eyes. So, and straw I found to be pretty slippery at times. Yeah, especially when it gets wet. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and now and, and I I I limit going super thick with shavings, just because it um it get it just, you, you just end up using a lot more that um, you have to clean out more. So um, yeah. Um, and then another trick we use, um, we, I buy EVA foam, like the gym mat flooring. They're like, uh, I think they're, I think they're 24 inches by 24 inches typically. Puzzle piece. In, puzzle piece interlocking. And then I, I put those under my rubber mats. If you have re removable rubber mats and I, I find it to be huge benefit fit for taking the road vibrate, right? Road vibration out, and um, the horses come out of the trailer a lot better. It's super cheap. Like a six horse trailer might cost you two hundred bucks. So um, and they're really easy to cut with a razor knife, yeah, so they're yeah. easy to fit in there. Yeah, and I usually go in with. I like to order it um, inch thick off of Amazon is the best place to get it and cheapest is what I found. And you said an inch thick. Yeah, and that it makes it's they'll say it's an inch thick, but it's actually going to be like seven eighths, sh slightly shy. So if you and same thing, if you go if it says it's half inch, it's going to be a little bit less, and then it ends up being too thin. So go with whatever, even if they advertise an inch, that's that's thick enough. Yeah. Okay. All right. Along and the same, you can you can spend thousands of dollars doing the comfort floor they talk about, but that's pretty much what it is. 
Okay. But it makes it nice because um, you can still take the mats, your your normal mats, you use your normal mats and you place it underneath your mats and then you can replace, you can take it all out and clean your trailers the same as normal. It just takes a little longer, but your horses will love it. Good advice. Along the same line, some people want to know, do you guys use shipping boots or leg protection of any kind or do you not use anything on, on long hauls? We don't put anything on um it, there's an occasion that if you have a big horse um that won't, likes to lean on the back of your trailer sometimes we have to put hawk boots so they don't rub up their hawks but that's a, a, a individual basis and we just have a pair of hawk boots i we don't even have normal shipping boots we end up always throwing them away because they they get they get nasty because we don't use them ever so yeah, so hawking boot, a uh, pair of hawk boots I keep in the trailer just in case because that's the only place I've ever had rubs where you have a big horse that likes to lean on the back wall. Okay. All right. Next question. So this one has to do with how long in a day you usually haul. Um, how many hours hauling in a day is what is something you would consider appropriate? So we, I've gone, we used to give them tons of breaks and offloading, walking, yeah, grazing. And that's like kind of more the old style. And um, once we started using the EVA mats, like we don't, we'll, like we've gone like where we've hauled like ah, 40, like 38 hours before we even got them off the trailer. We water them but we'll get into water later cool. but that's, that's we used super, to do that when we had more energy that was more like 24 but that's yeah. so still but, super but now like if i don't go 12 it, when i'm doing long haul multi-day hauling if i don't do 12 hours at least minimum 12 hours i feel like the day is wasted because you just you don't get anywhere in my opinion like so 12 is minimum for us and 15 between 15 12 is, and 15 is, is common on a is, long haul is process. more common per day yeah 12 to 15 is the but is that's average. jeremy's kind of a hercules driver so it's probably not going to be very achievable for a single driver yeah. that, that is a very long amount of time if you're by driving. yourself i i wouldn't go eight hours more than eight hours if you're by yourself unless you can you, you don't feel like you're getting tired because that's the biggest thing if you feel like you're getting tired that it's not worth it and they say being tired driving is worse than being drunk. And I believe it because you really space out pretty quick. And then we, you know, after that amount of time, then we will completely offload in a pasture type situation, not a stall. Mm -hmm. So horse can move around, stretch. We'll feed them off the ground so they can, you know, drain their nasal. I think we come to that. Maybe. Capacity. I don't know. Okay. But anyways, yeah. it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Repeat is good because we often forget yeah. things. So no, no problem. <laughs> yeah. So okay. in, in our, our big trailer, um, I actually had my stalls um, um, switch to um, stud dividers so that each horse has their own compartment and they're loose in each compartment so they can put their head down. And that's another, I, I know we're, we're, that's just a touch is like, Knowing your horse is important because some horses we've had in the past that after six hours, they get congested to the point where they start coughing from the trips. So they're really important to be able to get their head down. So um, once we stop and offload, we feed off the ground. We don't put them in hay, um, hay bags. So we want them to have their head down. So that's really important. And in uh, some horses, are, like I said, like after six hours would be, I'm so congested up that they will cough and whatnot. So yeah, it's well, important. We had one horse that it would ruin his event if you expected to compete when you arrive somewhere because mm -hmm. if he was tied, he would not be racing anytime soon. Yeah. Gotcha. Along the same lines, guys, uh, this wasn't a question mm -hmm. and I'm surprised it didn't come up. Do you, does your trailer have mangers or do you have a preference on that? Ours has mangers, but it's full width. But it's full width. So it's the full eight foot wide with mangers. Um, so they can put their head down. They don't necessarily, I mean, they don't, they, not all of them will put their head down, but um, some will. Um, I don't have, I mean, I know there's horses that you give them the opportunity, they still won't put their head down until they're stopped somewhere. Yeah. So I don't have much of a preference, but I do like if you have mangers to have a full width because it gets really narrow for them. If you have stalls, some people, 
like they have, you can have a um, like more like a stock style. And then obviously you got to tie their heads and you don't want them being able to bite their neighbors. So um, they're obviously not going to get their head down there, but, but they can adjust so they can have the full length if they need it. So, and that's the other thing is paying attention to jockeying of horses. Sometimes you'll have a horse that want to stand almost straight and push all the horses around so that a lot of horses don't are like kind of reaching out and their rope is too tight. So horses that want to turn straight, I, I have, tend to put them back towards um, the back of the trailer so they can't um, hog take their, the yeah, hog their buddies <laughs> sure. the space. Yeah. If you don't have dividers. Yeah. Gotcha. Good advice. Great. All right. Next question. Whenever my computer comes back. And no. on that same note, we put our, if we don't have dividers, the mares go in the back. Yeah. Geldings go in the front. Because mares tend to kick and geldings don't usually, usually. but um, the mares are more likely to kick. So they go further. They or go or get back. offended. Yeah. At some point. <laughs> if they've got to be touching. So. Gotcha. All right. The, the next question is on your 12 to 15 hour day trip, how often do you guys stop for a quick rest, potty break, eat, et cetera? And when you stop, yeah. huh? Yeah. So yeah, go, go ahead. You can finish. Sorry. So when you stop for fuel or food, how long do you, how long do your stops typically last? Do you have a standard or About, is it just kind of however it works yeah, out? We, yeah. We try to be really quick and super efficient. Like one of us goes in and pays because you usually get a discount if you've got cash. I don't know if, a yeah, lot if you of people carry don't. cash, you usually yeah. get five cents or more off yeah so it's worth having cash yeah not a crazy amount but yeah and then it's um, off in the long run um yeah so <laughs> so one of us will be fuel um heather usually runs in and give um gives the cash then i start pumping and she's going to the bathroom and then maybe getting a snack or something if or a coffee or something and then um so um and and then we what I try not to let, I ask Heather not to drink a lot because then we have to stop more often and that's just eating up time. So, um, and we, I always have an extra fuel tank added to my vehicles so that I can at least get, I can go six to seven hours without stopping. But um, most vehicles that have stock tanks like Chevy's have, are known for having smaller, but anyways, they're like four to five hours. So I like to be able to make it six or seven. And if we have to, if we have to use the, um, um, use the restroom, we usually pull off on exits um, out where they're, when you're not in city and we pee behind it between the trailer and the back of the truck for safety and for being out of view. But, um, um, and then for, for horses, um, yeah. yeah, so, so horses have hay in front of them 24 seven. We don't typically leave water with them because it usually sloshes out and, and the hay molds. or yeah. And then your hay gets wet and then molds and has other issues. And then also um, the horses, a lot of the time won't drink. They'll, they'll, they'll play with the water and, and it just becomes more of a mess. Um, and I, um, we offer water usually between six and eight hours is the first time. And, um, it sounds like that's a long time, but you, at home, the horses, if you ever watch their drinking patterns, a lot of time, they only drink two or three times total a day. But, um, I, I, like I said, we'll offer, if we're going to fuel up around that six to eight hour mark, we offer water and don't be alarmed. A lot of the time horses will not drink at that first drink. Even if you electrolyte them. Even if you electrolyte them. They're more likely, if you gave electrolytes, they're more likely to drink. I don't, and then I'll, I'll offer every two hours until they drink. And then I don't get alarmed until we hit the 12 hour mark if they're not drinking. So, um, and then they drink religiously. Yeah. After that, if you keep on your electrolytes, um, they will keep drinking and they'll get in the rhythm and being comfortable. And this is also where we would offer the outlast with yeah. those fuel stops. Yeah. The outlast has like a cycle of about six hours to do its full um, ramp up and ramp down to help and all it's doing is um, raising pH so it keeps their stomach less acidic. So, um, and it's just, it just, it, we noticed making a huge difference between their water intake and their eating because their stomach's more comfortable because it's no matter what, it's slightly stressful for them 
to be in a trailer. So you limiting their acid in their stomach just by a natural way, just buffering it seems to help them a lot. But like that, I, but that I want to hit home. It's really important that you offer water and everyone's different. But like I said, like you, most of the times, at, if you do it at six hours, no one drinks. The first day. Yeah. On the first so day. like, but by eight hours, majority of them will drink. And then all of them will drink by 12 hours. If they haven't drank, then that's when you've got to decide, am I going to stop for, I'm going to stop for the day if, if, if they haven't drank and then, um, and then try again the next day. Um, and, and so, so you can cut, you know, being flexible on the road is important. So if you have one that's not drinking at 12 hours, then um, I might push it a couple more hours and then quit early for the day. Um, if they haven't drank absolutely by 14, 15 hours, you need to stop and let them rest. Don't, don't worry. Don't like, don't stress too bad that they don't drink, but make sure they have good, clean water or wherever you stop and they drink. And if they don't drink, then that, that'd be the time. And we have never had it, but I, that would be the time I would call that and have them stomach tube fluids. Um, I wouldn't, but, but we've never had that happen. So as long as you electrolyte before and, um, but don't be alarmed if you get to 12 hours and that's the first drink they take. Um, so that's a big thing that a lot of people worry about, but yeah. That's very good advice. And some of us may never have also, gone more than 12. Yeah, yeah. And also on our road trips, we have hay easily accessible for us to reload the mangers. Yeah. That's another thing to keep in mind. So when you're on the road, you don't have to dig around or it's not yeah. difficult to get to your feed supplies. Yeah. And feed bags are personal, whether you want to do a slow feeder style or um, I've gotten clever on how I do with my trailer. Um, I can kind of explain it. I, I, I wish I would have had a picture actually, that would have been helpful is because we have mangers. I, I've taken um, their um, cargo netting, like their, you buy them at Walmart and you can cut two of them and you can get cut one into two, one into two, and you can use them um, to, and you have to, uh, I use little brackets that I found at the hardware store. And then I, and then I had carabiners. Um, <laughs> you can get clever on how you can secure them, but you can, you can manger the hay. You can have the hay stay in the manger by putting that cargo netting over the top of it. Or like the last, actually the last time I bought slow feeders and I cut each slow feeder in two. And then I, um, I, I secured them by running a strip of aluminum and I riveted it to my trailer. Now I'm getting kind of- And then he folds the top over and carabiners it yeah, to the, the back. Front. So yeah. then it holds the hay yeah. so they can just nibble the hay in front of them instead of tearing it out. Because the hay bags are the big open holes. They can pull all of it up and it's all by their feet and yeah. they can't get to it so well. So, so, so or you can have big slow feed nets tied securely so they can pull that out. But you'd be surprised how they can empty those um, and have it on the ground. Because they're horses. And, yeah, so, <laughs> but if your horses are in their own compartment by themselves and they can get it off the ground, then that's fine too. So those are kind of just different ideas. So um, just having, yeah, so, but yeah, so I, I, just having different options is uh, depending on your style of your trailer because I don't know personal, you know, what everyone's doing, but um, that's what we've done in different trailers we have. I like your idea. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> yeah. Because we've got one that pulls, puts all of his hay on the ground. All right. Yeah. Next question. So we, uh, I think we've kind of addressed this a little bit already, but if you have anything else to add, but the question was, do you leave water access in or only at stops, which you guys said you just generally offer at water, at, at breaks or stops? Mm -hmm. And how, and uh, you've already, I think, answered how often you offer it, but do you have anything else to add in regards to that? Yeah, I'll just clarify a little bit more. So um, we'll do between six and eight hours the first time we offer water. And then every two hours, but if they drink really good at that six or eight hour mark, then I will only give it every four-ish hours after that if they drink. But if they have not drank, I will offer every two hours until they drink. So, um, and then the other reason not to, for me not to hang water is you don't know if it's splashed or they played with it. You don't know they actually drink. So, um, 
And if hay gets in it, a lot of time they'll stop. They won't drink it because the hay ferments pretty fast when it's warm in a trailer. So um, that those are other reasons we don't leave water in with them. All right. I think that answered. I think you answered it pretty well between previous question and this question. So we'll uh, move on to the next question. And this one is, is it best to let the horses off the trailer after so many hours, or is it just okay to leave them resting on the trailer until you get to your destination at the end of the day? Yeah, so multi-day travel, I believe it's good to at least give them five to six hours um, just out. And but, but she's saying yeah. until you get to your destination. You leave them on. Oh yeah, so yeah. we leave them on until we get to the destination, except for if we have a multi-day trip. That's what. Yeah, so if we have a multi-day trip, we let them out. Well, every the destination night. for each day. Yeah. Rather yeah. than from Florida to Fort Howes, that would be one thing. But if our destination for each day is a twelve to fifteen hour target, then we leave them on until we hit that destination for the day, the yeah. twelve to fifteen hour target. Yeah. So we only let them off once a day. Okay. When they're going to get rest. Yeah. Yeah, and so, and, and, and then, so I know we're gonna come across the question, I was gonna answer another question, but we'll wait till we get to it, so. But yeah, we only let them off one, once a day. Unless there's an issue. Yeah. Like if some horse is looking poor, then we might change that plan. But if everyone looks the way they should while traveling, then they get their rest while we stop at the fuel stops, getting their water, you know, and keeping their hay topped off. And they will pee when you stop at those gas stations, because it usually takes about 30 minutes to fuel the tank, go pee, offer them all water, you know, it might take a little longer, even 30 is if you're really efficient. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so take home message too is to be flexible, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, and we also, just, just to add to that as well, we also have really good ventilation in our trailer, which I think is super, super important. So we have double drop down windows and roof vents. And if it's not cold, all of those are open. And, then we have and we fans. also have fans yeah. at the butt of every horse. That are running but that's not absolutely necessary so, I, don't, I don't know how much that those fans actually move other than what, if you're in standstill traffic i yeah. think that's when they become play into play yeah. okay i think you already answered this question too but um should we electrolyte horses when traveling um to encourage them to drink um but and you said you guys do but do you have anything else yeah. that you would want to elaborate on this or restress i guess I, I do hear it all the time that like people will not, they'll say, and I hear them mention it, like I didn't electrolyte because my horse didn't drink. Well, if, if a horse is stressed or whatever, or in exertion, like even an endurance ride, if a horse doesn't have the right sodium content in their cells, they will not, their thirst mechanism doesn't get tripped. So they won't drink. So, and like, it's like eating salty food. You get super thirsty. You can't like, or eat ice cream or something like that. Like, because of the amount of salt, it's going to make you thirsty. So, um, so, you know, we, we don't use harsh electrolytes. We use pretty much just Redmond salt, um, just sodium chloride on travel. And that seems to be the easiest to get them to, you know, drink. But that's I, I, when people say that they didn't electrolyte because they didn't drink. Well, that's the wrong that's the opposite of what you should do. If they're not drinking, you should give them more electrolytes because it will make, it will encourage them to drink more. Gotcha. All right, next question. This one came up several times from people that submitted questions and they wanted to know when traveling, particularly, we had a lot of questions from out, actually out West and from the Southeast. Um, when traveling in really warm, humid climates, do you prefer to travel at night versus daytime? Or, or, you know, obviously that's not always possible, but you know, what is your tips or tricks to get around the, the high temperatures and humidity? Yeah, so I, think, I feel like we do, we do travel at night um, when it's really hot. So if, if it's up, if it's dry hot, it's not, it's not as, um, a big deal as in when it's humid, but we do travel a lot. So usually when we leave Florida in the summertime, um, we'll leave that first day, we'll do nighttime driving. And then if it's, if we're, and we check the weather on our routes. So, and if it's, and if it's projected to be really crazy, like 
you know, heat index of like over a hundred with humidity, then um, we will travel at night or at least um, take our long breaks um, or in, the heat of the day. in the heat of the day, like stop between, you know, by one or two o'clock, we'll stop driving and let them rest and then maybe start super early. Um, when I say super early, I mean, just after midnight, one, two o'clock and um, get, you know, you get until you get seven, eight hours before it, the heat starts creeping up on you again. So, um, yeah. It's really rough though. Being not on a graveyard shift schedule normally. Yeah. And that's where, it, <laughs> yeah. it's rough. that's where it comes into play, like having two people because like Heather's good for about 45 minutes and I'm good for about two hours. So just getting that, even if, you know, if I get a 20, 30 minute little power nap while she might only have a range of 45 minutes, that, it, that recharges me for another two hours. So, um, and I know some people that um, travel, they rotate every two hours, regardless of how they're feeling, um, just so they always feel fresh behind the wheel. And, but, and we're not, when we're not on a graveyard schedule, Jeremy has about an eight to 10 hour range and I have about a four hour range. So we have to play with that. Yeah. And then also knowing which driver drives, like I drive horribly from sun rise till about 10 a.m. Horribly, it's like nap time. Where, you know, we have opposite times where we yeah, both well, get super I mean, sleepy. Uh, like mine is right right before that, right? Um, like midnight to 3 a.m. or 4 a.m.? No, it's like between 5 and 7 a.m. is my my time. I I, tr I really struggle, so I try not to drive in those in that time frame. Unless, I've been, unless I'm really fresh, but everyone's different, so meaning like my first day of travel I can make it but like my second day of travel those are the time for me that I'm terrible at so knowing those kind of things but the most important thing is if you're really exhausted don't even try to keep keep on yeah. just just stop and if, and, if you leave enough ahead of time you can waste several hours sleeping and it's totally fine yeah and leaving your horses <laughs> on that's that's totally fine just offer them water after a longer break like that. And then just account for that amount of time that they've been in that trailer. Um, because after so many, like, I don't know, three days um, for 12 to 15 hours, they do need some substantial amount of break, at least five to six hours. Cause in our, in our youth, we used to make it across the country with like one stop and horses did really well because you're going, you're doing really fast and you're done. And like, we make it across the country in about 50 hours. And we did meaning, one stop. Meaning California to Florida. Yeah, and you would just did one long stop of five or six hours if you can manage. And the horses look best doing that because um, every time you stop at a new place, the horses for about five or six hours are kind of in a, um, a haze. They really don't know where they are. But after that, those next three to four hours, they're like on alert now and they're not really resting. So, um, so we usually try not if we're, unless we're gonna stay for like a full day and visit friends and we're just gonna be at like overnighting somewhere, we usually try to not go longer than seven or eight hours stop because once they get past that four or five hour mark, they're on high alert because they're in a new place and that's where the stress starts on the road. So. Um, yeah, there's zombies for that first little bit. Yeah, and you're like where the heck am I? And that zombie, they'll eat during that zombie state, but they're super aggressive. But that's when we'll have hay on the ground for them and water accessible, right next to their hay. And then um, we're back on the road about two, three hours after that. So um, before they get a long time of being like super fully alert and stress, their stress starts to um, increase. So we feel like, um, I know we're gonna to touch this a little bit um, later, but the, the faster you can get to your destination, the better, especially if you don't have good um, um, tra um, travel accommodations, like you're not in pastures or whatnot. But um, if you're in stalls, horses, I mean, after a few hours, they're not very, they're, they're on high alert because it's a new place, new smells and everything. But if they're in a pasture, they're low, you can buy yourself more time. So, um, especially yeah. if they're not traveling alone, yeah. that'd be even more concerning, but yeah. if they're traveling with at least one travel buddy, that yeah. helps a lot. But we're going to, they're going to, that's one that yeah. yeah. come up. one of our last questions, but good yeah. advice. Very good advice. I'm learning lots. All right. Yeah. Next question. Um, and again, we, there's a lot of overlap in this, but I think it's good that we keep reemphasizing this because if they're like me, they need to hear it two or three times before it sinks in. Um, 
how many recovery hours and or days for the amount of hours that you're hauling or days. So basically, like you already pretty much addressed this, but if you could just kind of re-elaborate, you know, for every day, every day that you haul, how much rest period should we accommodate? Yeah. We do for every day, we do one day of rest at minimum. So um, yeah, three day haul, three days of rest before the race. So and, yeah, it would mean yeah. that you would have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of rest, Saturday race. Yeah. If you had three days of hauling. So if Mon, Mon, if you're in Montana is your goal this summer, and it's going to take you four out four days, then I'd give four days rest before the event. So, and on those rest days though, you're still walking your horse and you can go on light rides and stuff like that to keep their movement up a little bit, but, but, but at least they're like a chance to recover all the hydration and stuff like that. And, and we've heard a big error that we've heard commonly. I got to the raid four days early so I could ride each loop. I rode a loop every day. No, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Good advice. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next question. Uh, I think this is our last one, then we're gonna open it up. We've yeah. got quite a few questions in the Q&A session already, but um, this was another question that we got more than once and people wanted to know, did you guys have any advice if traveling with a lone or solo horse? We've done it super rare. Um, yeah, it's both of us riding, yeah, so we're fortunate. It's super rare that we've ever had to do that. But um, my, my opinion on horses, like if they if they're super independent and they kind of, and they live alone and they're okay with that, I think it's safe to travel alone with horses. But if they're not used to that and you don't know if they're used to it or not, you're asking for problems. So. Uh, ulcers and call yeah say. yeah so and, and going off a of feed and everything else and that's like the worst thing you want during travel because they're already not going to eat as much or drink as much as normal so um that's something to make sure you do your homework and know and and my, my if i ever if i have a horse that's not an independent and i went to an event by itself i would take a buddy with it i, I know it's a lot of hassle but if, if, if it's not used to being alone, I, I wouldn't even mess with it, especially if it's some big thing for big time event for you that you have a huge amount of gold. And I would Those bring gastro guard for the buddy horse so that when you leave that poor buddy horse tied to the trailer on event day, he doesn't <laughs> dig himself into a hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Well, um, we're not vets, so we're not recommending you give yeah. your horse gastro guard. You ask your, <laughs> we do vet. use gastro guard, but but uh, uh, but under our vet um, recommendations, yeah. And you guys said you don't you don't use Gastrogard because now you rely heavily on the Outlast as is kind of cover that. Will, we on the super rare occasion that we get a new horse in and we know they suspect for ulcers, we'll treat them or an extra stressy special case horse. Yeah, we'll give it before travel. But across the board for the herd, the Outlast typically works. Yeah, like I, we have one horse out of 20 that gets it occasionally and he it's super occasional. Yeah. But we always have it. Don't get us wrong. Yeah. We always have it on hand in case yeah. we need yeah. it. Yeah. Wise, good advice. Good advice. Yeah. All right. I think that leads us to the end. Yep. Um, and we do have quite a few questions in the chat box. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to read through these. So bear with me. Um, and then if there's any burning questions that people want to unmute themselves, then they can do that. So um, just bear with me just a second here. We had a couple questions at the beginning that I think I answered. Um, Nancy wants to know, she said, I'm very interested in in that as a former marathon runner who wants to talk details with people who are in the know, um, what is the longest you will go on one day haul ever? Uh, well, I mean, I'll, we've gone 24 hours. Yeah, 24, we'll go for 24 <laughs> we've hours. gone a full day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're hardcore. <laughs> But, but that was not to arrive at a competition. Well, but we would do it if we, and if we, we would, if we went for 24 hours, we'd give two days off. That's for sure. But Actually. when we, when we've called the competition, we do not do those kind of hours. That's if we're going from Florida to California and the horse are going to do nothing for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Gotcha. And we're not going to an event. We're just going from place to place. That's a little mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Bill's question is no grain, but would soaked beet pulp and hay pellets be okay? 
Um, and he said, I yeah, have to move to Arizona to Idaho in a couple months. And I'm curious about that. But not molasses beet pulp. Plain yeah, beet pulp. Plain beet pulp. Yeah. Just the plain up, straight up beet pulp. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, Kayla says, how do you choose a truck or rig for towing? For example, how much truck does one need to tow a horse, a two horse bumper pull versus a two horse gooseneck versus a three horse gooseneck or bigger? Oh, uh, well, so all vehicles have their door ratings on the, um, inside the, inside the edge of the doors of their, of the vehicles. It says how much you can tow and everything. And those are underrated. So if you go off of those, you're way safe. So, and those, and those also are legal limits, meaning um, if you get an accident and you have insurance, it will cover you. If you're overweighted, it won't cover you. So those are, so those door ratings are all all on the inside of everyone's vehicle door from driver's side door. So um, yeah, so I, that, that's, yeah, I wouldn't go more than that other than just read those ratings. Yeah. Okay. Um, Christine says, if you don't feed grain on a regular basis and do feed grass hay on a regular basis, would you just keep them on that same feeding routine all the way through to competition? Yeah, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, yeah, just feed the grass hay. Yeah. Okay. But that was a good point on the last one, like um, with the soaked bee pulp and grass pellets. If you have a horse that isn't eating, isn't interested in eating, you can give something wet like that soaked um, pellets and um, bee pulp to help them, encourage them to eat and get a little bit more water in them. And that's, and, we're, and we don't usually do that kind of stuff, but, but we will do it if we have one that won't drink. So those are, those are good ways to get your horse to drink more. Yeah, and if you're not used to that, perhaps practice that at home because they do soak up a surprising amount of water. Yeah. So know ahead of time how long it takes to soak them and how much water they'll actually, con the, the feed product will actually consume yeah. so that you're not thinking you're going to do that quickly somewhere. Yeah. yeah, just talking, you know, with the bee pulp between the shreds and the pellets. And, yeah. once, and, and bee, bee pulp does better than um, grass pellets um, turning. So the grass pellets, when it gets, if it's summer weather, within... A, a, a hour or two, that stuff starts going rancid. So uh, that's stuff I, I worry about too. So. Yeah. Um, Erica says that veterinarians who also compete in endurance have told her specifically not to feed electrolytes if a horse is on a trailer because they won't have free choice water and may not drink enough at stops. Um, so she says, can you clarify how electrolytes are used during the journey and how you make sure that they're drinking enough? And I, you might have already addressed this, but I mean, you know, with your conversation. Yeah, I just give them, I give them one, I just, we just give them one dose of electrolytes. Um, Before they get on every morning. Yeah, and That's we it. just go, whatever the recommended pre-mix or whatever, just the, what the recommended dose for a dose is, and we give it. And we've not had any problems. And perhaps and, at night too, when we offload them. And if it's very hot. Yeah, if it's very hot at night, we'll give them another one. When they get to their destination. For the but day. we, but you don't, we don't, like at night, we let them drink and have the opportunity to drink for a, a substantial amount of time before we ever offer them another electrolyte, just because if a lot of time that they won't want to drink right after it. So sure. you wait if you're going to give them that second dose. But um, I, I mean, that's that's the point of offering water um what i mean every four hours once they start drinking and every after i hit six hours every two hours until they drink so um but that that's that's just what's worked yeah, for us that's what's always worked for us and yeah we haven't had and, any problems and yeah and you're just using the redmond salt um yeah that's the main yeah that's what we use for for um for travel yeah okay and they now um, make redmond salt actually now makes a tube of electrolytes yeah, so it's even more convenient pre -mixed but tube, we yeah. just mix the daily red in a syringe with water and that works as well yeah gotcha and we use like one ounce of scoop and then a, an 18 ounce bottle makes eight doses so but you have to you have to shake it up every time but that's an 18 ounce um, will be six um, a 60 cc syringe, it would give you eight doses. So it's not so, very concentrated. Yeah, it's not concentrated at all. Yeah. Okay. 
And we had several follow-up questions um, in the chat um, pertaining to this discussion. And I think you answered all the questions. And if, if for some reason somebody feels that we didn't, they can unmute themselves and clarify. Um, Kayla said, do you tie the horses in the trailer or do you let them be? How do you decide? You already answered that, but if you could just re-clarify. Yes, yeah, so we tie. Um, if there's no divider. If there's no divider, we do tie. And on our big trailer, sometimes we have too many horses and we have to take some dividers out and, and add an extra one in. So, um, and they will be tied um, and we'll put them next to their buddies so we limit um, the chance of horses biting. But, but when they're tied, they absolutely aren't long enough that they can reach the other horse's back, but they can't, they can, you can't tie them really. It, yeah they have to be able to get their head down a little bit. You can't tie them so tight that they can't, um, that they'll be able to re reach each other's necks. So you, that, you still have the chance of that happening, but. We have had, yeah. with all this talk about biting, we've had a horse sabotage our ride before by biting yeah. the crud out of his neighbor's back. Yeah, so definitely tie them <laughs> short enough that they can't reach the other neighbor's back, but not but, too short that they um, can't get their nose down pat, um, past the manger a little bit. Or, when we yeah. have the dividers. Yeah, the dividers are, if you have full dividers, I have them loose, yeah. Gotcha. Um, next question is from Bill, and he wants to know if you guys have ever tried sweet water, the rice bran mixed with water or anything similar to encourage drinking while traveling. I have, and my horses don't like it. <laughs> they don't They don't drink it, yeah. So that, I mean, That's if your horse likes preference. it. Yeah. If your horse likes it, awesome. And on <laughs> average, our horses, they just don't like it. We. Mm, yeah. Once, once upon a time, I had a, you, I got, I was getting some carrot powder and I mixed it with water and you could get any horse to drink. And then I could never find that, that specific carrot powder ever again. I tried tons of them. And then the other ones I think were too bitter or something. Never, yeah. would not drink it. never yeah. even heard of carrot powder. Oh gosh. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. dehydrated ground up carrot powder. But that, um, <laughs> but if you get ca carrot juice works good adding to your water. And mm -hmm. some horses, you don't need to add that much. And some horses, you need to add a lot, but you can get them to drink that way. That's another trick. Yeah. Sure. Makes sense. But you do, you do waste your expensive carrot juice. If, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if that would add up fast. And you don't know, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but those are tricks. If you absolutely can't get them to drink, you could try those. Yeah. Okay. Good advice. Um, that, I think, pretty much summarizes the... Q&A questions. However, several people were interested in trying to reach you for some coaching and want to know how best to reach out to you or how to get in touch with you. Um, they can call my cell phone number and I can just tell that to you, I guess. <laughs> okay, if you're okay with that. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's on our website anyways. Um, it's 408-687- 7082. And just remember on Eastern Standard Time, so don't be calling me at some weird hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's and good. I almost forgot I, to clarify for this webinar that we were going to be on Eastern Standard Time until somebody asked. So, yeah. <laughs> um, very good that you mentioned that. Um, yeah, I, I do turn my phone to airplane mode at nighttime, so I really won't be woken up. So I, I just turn it off. <laughs> gotcha. So that's all the questions. If anybody has any burning questions for Heather and Jeremy, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask individually any questions that you might have before we wrap things up for the night. Here's your chance. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Give it a second here. Or if there's any last minute questions, you're welcome to type them into the chat box. Um, but we really appreciate Heather and Jeremy um, giving up of their time to do this. Um, this was very, very good advice. I learned a lot tonight. So um, if anything, um, on behalf of all of our participants tonight, I think at our peak, we had close to 70, which is awesome. Um, I wanna wow. thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. You're, you're very welcome. Yeah. So any last minute questions from anybody? Oh, wait, let me see. I got, um, hang on. Might be just th thanking you guys here. Yep, lots of thank yous, lots of thank yous.
Exactly. Well, we hope um, we see a lot of you at the national championship. Or tennis, like our background there, that yeah. swinging bridge. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we won't belabor this any longer. But again, I really appreciate your time. And thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate it. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Good, night. good night. Good night. Have a good one. Thank you, everybody.